Oh. All right. Recording? Absolutely. Cool. So I'm going to talk about Ublek, which gets its name from the uh, Dr. Seuss story about a little boy who saves the kingdom from the reigning Ublek. All right. So non-Newtonian fluids, which is what Ublek is, uh, is as opposed to a Newtonian fluid whose viscosity is predictable um, and changes with temperature and things. A non-Newtonian fluid will just different uh, is different from that in some way, uh, mainly on shear stress, uh, and this includes soaps, cosmetics like your shampoo, uh, butter, ketchup, yogurt. Ketchup actually decreases, uh, decreases its viscosity when you drop something in it. If you move through it really fast, it all the hard liquid gets out of the way, and the juicy stuff is left behind. So that was cool. I didn't test ketchup though. Um, blood is a non-Newtonian fluid because it congeals. So, and finally, oobleck. And this is oobleck. You can do some really cool stuff with it, like put it on speakers. Um, and just, I'm just going to acknowledge that because I didn't do it. I didn't have a pair of speakers to wreck. Um, but there are some really cool photographs and thousands of videos. So you can look those up at any time. And it does, because um, Ublek gets more viscous when you put a force on it, um, the upward force from the speaker going up into the Ublek makes it solid. And then the, spe the speaker cone goes down. And so you have no viscosity anymore, but it's still up there in some sort of structure, and that comes up again and makes it harder, and so you get these weird, like, structures building up, and that's how that works. So I got the idea to test how uh, the viscosity of the oobleck is actually changing. Um, I give it's linear, and this is an image taken from a wonderful uh, set of lab instructions that included a lot of the math for building this thing, uh, which is this thing, um, and also the, the important stuff. It didn't include any actual instructions for building it, uh, but this diagram was just basically what I based everything off of. I don't have gears or anything like that, which is what's in there. Um, but now to give like a kind of background on viscosity, uh, this is kind of a complicated diagram, but basically you have and it's something moving within a fluid re with respect to something that's not moving. Um, and F equals mu times A times this gradient, the speed over the Y dimension. Um, and that's kind of like a derivative, but not really. It's a little bit different. Um, it's a ratio and yeah, you, you, can't, you can't treat it like I couldn't just multiply by y and get y on the other side. That would have made the math a little bit easier, but yeah. Um, so shear stress is, as I define it, s equals f over a, which means it has units of pascals, and the viscosity has units of pascal seconds, which is a weird unit, but it, the viscosity, here dynamic viscosity, is just a ratio. So, um, and I use tau as torque. But I derived this Fandy equation uh, from the set of lab instructions. And I started with the idea that the shear stress, if I can get rid of that, <laughs> is equal to that times k times the uh, angular frequency. And where k is some constant, is some constant that depends on the geometry of your device. Uh, so like the radius of the rotor, the radius of the outer container wall, uh, not necessarily friction, but um, the, the stickiness or adhere, adhesiveness of the walls of your container. So that was handy. Um, and then, I worked with that for a little while, worked and eventually got this handy equation where C is a new constant that just incorporates that original constant which has more to do with the adhesiveness along with the radii and uh, the spindle radius here. Um, and I have all that in my lab notebook. All right, and V here is always terminal velocity. Always, always, always because we are, I am dropping things and I'll get to that.
but that's the important velocity. And so I built this, it took me a couple days, and running around to various fishing uh, shops and Target and my dad's garage. Um, it was a fun day. Uh, yep, spent about 40 bucks on it and got mass hangers and stuff from Doc. So that was fun. Um, and this is the data that I took. So first I tested uh, water with this and that was to determine the uh, geometry constant, C. So C was equal to um, all that stuff, if you remember, divided by the uh, viscosity. All right? And so I have a bunch of trials from C. And I basically, since water wasn't very viscous, it didn't actually approach its terminal velocity. I dropped it from about this high. Um, so I just fit it with an exponential function. And the value that it's increasing here is V out there because a normal exponential function just approaches zero. So whatever constant is at the end there is the value, is the terminal velocity. Uh, this second graph here is way more interesting. This is what happens, um, I'm gonna demonstrate right here real quick. But I fill this with, with the fluid and then I just let it go and I take the velocity from here and this is actually frictionless enough that it will start to spin from just the mass of the hook, and it's still accelerating. When I fill this with just oobleck, I got this graph, and with just the weight of the hook. So I only got this graph with a very small mass on there, which is a very small shear stress um, on the fluid. But it's really interesting because basically what this graph is saying is that the oobleck is changing its viscosity while the weight is dragging on it. So you get, and this is just a, uh, an exponential function added onto a sinusoidal, sinusoidal function. So if you can imagine the exponential function and then you get values oscillating around it. Um, and that, uh, if you picture the weight drops, the fluid reacts, the fluid gets solid, the weight slows. The fluid gets a little bit less viscous again, and fluid drop and the solid drops more. And so you get that end, never ending cycle, and that's what makes this graph. Uh, but it didn't really happen at higher, visco at higher masses, higher shear stresses, so that was fun. Um, and eventually, I got these weird spikes. Um, and that's, I had to stop at about 210 grams, um, but these spikes are the result of the oobleck hardening, so much so, that it became a plastic, became it reached its plastic limit, and this PVC just slipped, and then it suddenly became a liquid again, and you know it kept going, and so I just took the average from between those spikes, and that worked pretty well. Uh, this is an example of my data. That's how I got C for um, water from the water, and then I used C later on, and I'll get to that. But that little that graph like there was so frustrating when I got to it because I was like, there's no way that's linear. My, my data is terrible. Um, but I then graphed the viscosity versus the actual shear stress, and I wanted to leap into my parents' bedroom at 1 in the morning and wake them up because I was so excited. Uh, but so yeah, I used the, the constant C, and unfortunately I don't have a value for the accuracy of C. Uh, I could have tested oil or some other known viscosity like that to find the accuracy of my setup, um, but I didn't have time. Uh, the, however, the accuracy doesn't matter as much here as the relationship of the data to each other. And so we can see here that like, just clearly, as I'm putting more shear stress on, I'm getting more viscosity. Should we very stop you and applaud right now for the graph? I think yeah, we should. Yeah. I think. Yeah. But um, then the mathematical analysis of that just allows me to say that for some concentration of oobleck, um, that is less that allows for some sort of uh, liquid flow. Um, like obviously, if you if you have way too much cornstarch, uh, and oobleck is just two parts uh, cornstarch, one part water, for my concentration. Um, but if you have too much cornstarch, it doesn't move at all. Uh, but you can. But with mine, uh, K was about 
uh, 2.46 times 10 to the negative third seconds, which is a really weird constant, but it's not a time. <laughs> uh, just like C was measured in meters. So I don't know what that pertains to. It might have something to do, uh, this would actually be an interesting comparison with the uh, period of, if you remember that sinusoidal graph that went up. Um, but I didn't check that out. Anyway, are there any questions? I have a question. Yeah. Can you go back to that to that beautiful graph that you saw? That so, one? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you said that like non-Newtonian fluids are not predictable the viscosity, but according the, to this graph, it kind of looks like it is. It is. Um, how the fluid reacts. So uh, there, there's stress and there's strain, and the, the fluid strain, which is how it reacts from the stress, uh, is not, the strain is not linear to the stress. It, it's weird and it's funky for Ublik. Um, I, I could graph stress versus strain, and it would probably be uh, a quadratic or something. Are you suggesting there's an integral relationship between that and this that we're discussing right here? I mean, I wonder if you can, for Zach, can you connect stress and strain and viscosity all together um, with some equations or something? Shear right? stress, so the, the fluid is acting on this central rotor, and so say it's, it's some radius and it's some height for the uh, relevant portions of it, and so I just have a cylinder and I just have an area of that cylinder right there. And so the shear stress is going to be just the force on that whole area, um, and that exerts a torque on the rotor. Okay, and so, uh, and there's a shear stress back on the fluid that's equal and opposite, and that's supplied by the torque from the falling weight once it's reached terminal velocity. Um, and so, and then the viscosity is just how that reacts. So let me go back to right there. So. We can rearrange just this equation to say that uh, S uh, equals viscosity times this weird integral thing uh, that technically looks like that, right? The gradient? The gradient, yeah. Not integral thing, but uh, derivative-ish thing. Uh, so then with mine, uh, I used the water trials to get just solve for C and then took the known viscosity of water times dm dv, which is just the slope of that linear graph. I can't get to it. Never mind. That linear graph with water. Yeah. <clears throat> and then solve for mu and uc, which was known for the device for Ublik. Thank you. So, um, what's it called? Is there a generally an accepted value where if you go past this shear modulus, you generally consider it a solid? You can consider it a solid. You can consider anything a solid if your time, uh, the time that you're measuring it is slow enough. Like if you're moving really, really fast, the air doesn't appear to be moving. Um, but calling something a solid is kind of weird. Like, it's a very indefinite boundary. So for all intents and purposes, if I stab the book with a fork, yeah, it's a solid because it's not gonna, it's, the fork is not going through. Um, if you shoot it with a bullet, the bullet is going through. But that's because bullets go through solids. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, if it was like a large enough bullet, do you think that it would stop it, the, the solid There wood. is There is research being oh, done with non-Newtonian fluids, um, yeah. and they're very practical, very applicable Occupy. in uh, body armor, actually, uh, because you have um, Kevlar, which is just made of strands of really tightly woven fabric, yeah. um, and that is really good for stopping bullets, um, but it's not so good when you have a knife coming up against it. Um, really hard and fast for a shank, and so this is something that they want for prison guards um, who just, it's really hazardous job because 
Um, you know, a prisoner gets his hands on a ruler, makes a shank out of it, and it's not a bullet. The guard has to be mobile enough that he can move around and tussle with these guys. He can't be armed, um, but he doesn't want to get stabbed. So they make, uh, there's, they're working on it. I don't know if they have them out yet, but the last time I checked, um, they were currently in development. These body armors. Ooblek vests? Is that what you're saying? They are not out of, made out of ooblek, per se, but it is a similar material which is woven into the fabric, uh, long strands of molecules. The way this is working is the starch in the ooblek, uh, which is a long molecule, um, just strands of glucose, uh, and you have just enough water that the water molecules kind of fit in between, and you have the spaghetti, almost, of starch molecules. And when there's no shear stress or very little shear stress, those have enough time. It's all about the time. They have enough time to move around each other. So you have a low viscosity. When you smack it really hard, they don't have enough time. They compact. And you actually get a an expanding wave of solid solidity, solidness, <laughs> away from the area of impact. Uh, there are really cool videos of that, too. It's like the solidification if you hit expanding. It, if you hit it, it's like a sound wave. Mm -hmm. Because it's molecules bumping into one another. It's, it is practically, for all intents and purposes, a sound wave, because it's moving through at the speed of sound, through the fluid, and you get that expanding, yeah, viscosity, yeah. So does that mean if you shoot something at it faster than the speed of sound, once it breaks through the initial slight barrier, it would be like going through uh, something, because it would be going faster Ooh, than... Like, we, are, we are talking about starch molecules, they're not yes, especially strong. <laughs> oh, because you can just break the spaghetti then. Yeah, you That's can the just issue. break the spaghetti. Um, which is why we don't make body armor out of spaghetti. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> yes. Yet. Uh, this is going to change a little bit. But, uh, yeah, it, there's a plastic limit with solids. So. Any further questions for Ben? I had one. Oh, really cool. Thanks.